thank you so much. It is really an honor to be here today. Uh, I want to express my uh, appreciation to the director uh, and to all of the Menzikong physicians and staff in all of the work that they're doing, uh, uh, and especially the support that they have provided for our Tukdam project, which I'll mention in just a few minutes. Uh, so what I thought I would do is spend the first part of this talk uh, describing a little bit about the focus of the work that we're doing now in our center. Uh, we are focused on the topic of well-being. And we use well-being rather than happiness because the idea is, isn't really to be happy all the time. If a sad event or something uh, tragic occurred, it would not be appropriate to be happy in that moment. I've seen His Holiness the Dalai Lama cry in response to a description of a tragedy. Uh, and so at that moment, uh, there is uh, an appropriate expression of sadness. And so it's possible to be sad and to have very high levels of well-being at the same time. Uh, and so that's why we prefer the term well-being. Uh, another term that we also use is flourishing. And uh, what we believe is that every human being, uh, as His Holiness says, every human being is the same. We're all built in the same way. Uh, and every human being has the capacity to flourish. Uh, and we would even go a little further, and we would say that every human being has the right to flourish, and also has all of the necessary constituents, the necessary components, or uh, the underlying uh, mechanisms that enable uh, a person to flourish or to have well-being. So um, the reason why we're so interested in well-being is because we believe that well-being is best regarded as a skill. Uh, it can be trained. Uh, and so a person is not necessarily stuck at the level uh, that she or he may experience. Uh, and this is one of the great insights that we've gleaned from our study of Buddhism uh, and the um, uh, importance of training the mind in the Buddhist framework. And this is an area where His Holiness has taught us so much uh, and emphasized the importance of training the mind. Uh, and so what we have found quite remarkably is that when a person trains their mind, their well-being improves and their brain changes. Uh, and not just the brain, but many other things in their mind and body also change. The two great drivers of plasticity, or the two great mechanisms of plasticity, uh, are neuroplasticity, which is changes that can occur in the brain, and the equivalent of neuroplasticity in the realm of genomics, uh, and that we call epigenetics. Epigenetics is the science of how our genes are regulated. So all of us are born with a sequence of base pairs that constitute our DNA. And for the most part, that will not change over the course of your lifetime. But what will change is the extent to which any gene is turned on or turned off. Our genes are highly dynamic, and they can switch on and off quite rapidly and in response to events in our environment, in response to our emotions, our demeanor, uh, and uh, they also play 
a very important role in understanding how uh, our minds uh, are connected to our health because uh, changes in epigenetics can be associated with increased vulnerability to certain kinds of physical disorders uh, that impact our health. So in our work on well-being, we have formulated a framework for understanding the key pillars or the key components of well-being. So what are these four key pillars? I will go through them. The first pillar we call awareness. Awareness is where mindfulness would be. Awareness is where attention would be. And uh, our awareness is key to so much of what we do. So let me give you some examples. Uh, we know that uh, uh, we can voluntarily regulate our attention. So if I asked you to please pay attention to this glass of water, all of you would, in one way or another, to some extent, be able to focus your attention on this glass of water. Or if I asked you to attend to the sensations in your right foot, right now, Probably some of you can bring your attention to that part of your body. And it turns out that this quality of awareness, our capacity to regulate our attention, can indeed be trained. There was a very famous scientific experiment that was published about 10 years ago now that is um, really a critical experiment in this area. And let me share with you what was done. It involved about 3,500 people in different parts of the world. And it took advantage of the fact that many people these days, most people, carry around a smartphone. And so participants were asked their permission to text them at different points throughout a day. And they were asked three questions. The first question is, what are you doing right now? And they checked off from a list of activities what they were doing. Could be eating, it could be doing your washing the dishes, it could be working, whatever it might be. You checked off what you were doing. Second question, where is your mind right now? Right at this moment, where is your mind? Is it focused on what you're doing? Or is it focused elsewhere? And the third question that participants were asked is right at this moment, how happy or unhappy are you? Right now. And they're asked to rate on a slider scale how happy or unhappy they were. So here's the finding from this study. The average person spends 47% of her or his waking life not paying attention to what they're doing. 47% of the time. So if they were supposedly working, almost half the time their mind was wandering. It was lost. They weren't paying attention to what they're doing. And when they were not paying attention to what they were doing, they reported that they were significantly less happy. Even if what they were doing was mundane and what we say pedestrian, uh, ordinary activity like washing the dishes or doing your laundry, so even those mundane activities, if your mind is wandering, you are less happy. 
when you're doing it. And the title of this scientific paper is A Wandering Mind is an Unhappy Mind. A Wandering Mind is an Unhappy Mind. Really important. And so we know that simple practices, for example, of shamatha meditation, can help cultivate this quality of awareness and decrease the likelihood that a person becomes distracted. So the second pillar of well-being we call connection. And connection is about the qualities that are important for healthy social relationships. His Holiness reminds us that we are all social animals. And one of the things that social animals do is they form connections with other people. And qualities like appreciation, gratitude, kindness, compassion, are all part of this pillar of connection. Now, one of the really exciting developments in scientific research over the last 10 years has been the discovery that we all come into the world with a propensity or a predisposition toward kindness and toward what we would say is pro-social behavior, altruism. How do we know that? Well, if we expose a six-month-old baby to a scenario like puppets, puppets who are playing with each other, and sometimes they're playing in a warm-hearted way, and other times they are behaving in a selfish way, a six-month-old baby strongly prefers warm-hearted. In fact, in a recent study with a very large group of six-month-old infants, 100% of infants show this preference. So it's not just a small statistically significant difference. It's huge. Virtually every infant shows this. And this is really important because it meshes, it confirms something found in the Buddhist tradition, uh, which is this notion of innate basic goodness, that all human beings are born with Buddha nature, we all have the seeds of kindness within us, and scientific research strongly confirms that this is true. So when we meditate on compassion, we're not trying to create a novel emotion, but rather we're familiarizing ourselves with the very nature of our own mind, because compassion and kindness are at the core of what it is to be human. However, we think of kindness and compassion in a way that's very similar to the way sci other scientists think about language. Every human being comes into the world with a biological capacity for language. But we know that in order for that capacity to be expressed, it needs to be nurtured. And so a child who is not raised in a normal linguistic community will not develop normal language. And similarly, a child who doesn't receive love and kindness from his caregivers will not develop these qualities normally. And you know, His Holiness reminds us that the seeds of compassion are often in the relationship between a child and his mother. <coughs> Excuse me. That a mother provides for the child, provides kindness and uh, care 
for the child and represents this early seed of compassion. So this is the second pillar. I've told you about awareness. I've told you about connection. The third pillar we call insight. And insight is a curiosity-driven knowledge of the self. And the self is a narrative, <coughs> a narrative that we all construct about who we are. And this is the scientific equivalent of emptiness, or shunyata. Uh, and it's having this insight into the nature of the self and the insubstantiality of the self and the recognition that what we call the self is simply a constellation of thoughts and beliefs and it's always changing. And this recognition helps to loosen the constraints that this narrative imposes and is very important for our well-being. And research shows that it's not so much about changing the narrative that is important, but it is changing our relationship to this narrative so that we can see the narrative for what it is, which is really a constellation of thoughts. Um, so this is the third pillar of well-being. The fourth pillar of well-being we call purpose. And purpose is about identifying our sense of direction in life. And it is not so much about finding something more meaningful and purposeful to do, but how can we find meaning and purpose in that which we are already doing, including in the regular activities of our daily life? Like uh, uh, in the United States, we have to take out our garbage and put it um, in, in a can on the street, uh, uh, or cleaning the house, or washing your dishes, can those simple activities be associated deeply with your sense of purpose? And the answer is yes, of course they can, but it requires a shift in mindset. Uh, and so uh, uh, we can uh, invoke the intention that I'm cleaning the house for the benefit of others, so that when uh, others in the family and guests come in the house, they will feel more comfortable. So serving others in this way, and this is really an extension of compassion, uh, is so important in cultivating this sense of purpose. So these are the four pillars of well-being. And just to review them once more, awareness, connection, insight, and purpose. Each of these four pillars has different brain states associated with them that we and other scientists have characterized. And we know that each of these four pillars of well-being shows plasticity. That is, each of them can be trained. And we know that when we train them, we can enhance our well-being. And we have developed an app called the Healthy Minds Program where you can learn some of the science and meditation practices for each of these four pillars of well-being. And the app is freely available throughout the world. Unfortunately, it's only available in English. But uh, if you um, uh, are uh, an English speaker and understand it, you can download it and um, check it out. So it's available uh, um, all over the world for, on both Android and um, Apple devices. Um, so uh, I want to now um, uh, pivot to our work on Tukdam, 
uh, since uh, I was asked to say a few words about this. We began this project um, now many years ago at the request of His Holiness. Um, uh, His Holiness uh, made the request that we investigate Tukdam, and I believe that one of uh, his interests, His Holiness's interest in studying Tukdam is because this represents a real challenge to Western science because uh, uh, the suggestion in the traditional Tibetan texts is that there is a subtle quality of awareness that is still present even after the conventional Western definition of death, after the heart has stopped beating, after the breathing has stopped, there there is said to be uh, this r subtle quality of awareness, uh, this clear light stage that is still present. And of course, if this is confirmed by modern scientific methods, it will um, be a very, very important discovery and will really have tremendous implications for many different areas of science. And so over the course of the last roughly uh, um, 10 or 12 years, we've had uh, equipment here in India, both here in the Dharamsala area as well as in the south, in Balakupe, uh, where there are the large monasteries, uh, to um, be available to investigate these cases of Tukdam. And uh, uh, so far we have studied more than 20 cases and uh, um, there is um, not that much that we can say at this point, but there is one finding which seems to be quite consistent, and that is that the body of a practitioner in Tukdam does not decompose uh, in the same way that a body of a normal person who is not in Tukdam does. And so uh, we've had cases up to 38 days uh, in Tukdam where the body remains quite preserved, uh, fresh, uh, without any smell, uh, and um, with the skin still very pliable and no um, rigor mortis. Uh, so this is extremely unusual. And uh, 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 we believe that when we publish these initial findings on the slowed rate of decomposition, it will uh, really be a, uh, an important both challenge and opportunity for the mainstream scientific community. Uh, in the West, when we think about death from a biomedical perspective, a traditional biomedical perspective, we think of it almost like a, uh, uh, in a binary way, like an on-off switch. Um, there's a moment that you're alive and the next moment you're dead. Well, even from a strictly materialist perspective, biological systems don't work in this kind of binary way. Uh, they're much more graded, much more gradual. And so it's very unlikely that everything shuts down instantaneously at the same time. It's much more likely that different aspects of our body and mind and brain uh, um, die at different rates. And so this is one of the several contributions that we believe the Tukdam project will make. One of the uh, decisions that we've made over the last several days in meetings that we've had here at Menzikong, 
uh, with all of the uh, teams that are working on the Tukdam project, including colleagues in Russia who are working on this, as well as um, the Menzikong staff, and also some scientists that we've um, recruited to collaborate with us from NIMHANS, which is the National Institute of Mental Health and um, Neuroscience in Bangalore, which is one of the top Indian neuroscience institutes. Um, what we have decided to do is to begin a major longitudinal study of practitioners in the monasteries in the south who are 75 years and older. And we will follow them through their passing and then uh, uh, hopefully obtain their consent while they are still alive to enable us to monitor them uh, as they die and some of them will go into Tukdam, and some of them will not. And that is going to be itself a really interesting and important question. Can any of the measures that we take of brain activity while a practitioner is still alive predict whether he will go into Tukdam when he dies? We do not know the answer to that. When I asked His Holiness on one occasion, I, I said, Your Holiness, can you predict uh, whether a particular person will or will not go into Tukdam when they die? He thought about it for a little bit, and he said, no, he doesn't think so. He doesn't think he can predict. So uh, it will be interesting to see if any of these scientific measurements can predict. We don't know. Uh, at the very least, they will provide some important baseline information for us and will enable us to ideally be able to measure these practitioners right after they meet the conventional Western definition of death. Uh, the earliest we've been able to get to a case of Tukdam is 26 hours after a practitioner has died. So we've missed the first full day. And there is some reason to believe that that first 24-hour period is going to be very, very important for scientific reasons. And so we want to be able to uh, do the measurements that we do immediately after a person passes and if we recruit participants while they're still alive and obtain their consent, we, I think, will increase the likelihood that we can begin recording immediately. So this is one of our longer-term goals. We will also be hiring a, a postdoctoral scientist from Nimhans uh, to be on the ground managing this project. Up until now, we have not had a full-time scientist uh, who is monitoring uh, and supervising the project. And it will be very, very good uh, for us to have that. And so through our collaboration with the Laboratory for the Study of the Neuroscience of Consciousness at Nimhans, we will uh, have a postdoc who will be the project manager for the Tukdam project. They'll be paid full time to do this, and uh, they'll be doing these studies uh, in the south of India. So um, that is a, a synopsis of where we are with the Tukdam project. And um, maybe I'll stop here for the moment and we'll be very happy to answer any questions. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Professor, for this wonderful, insightful, and elucidating talk. Now we'll open for the questions. So the request is to keep it simple and straight, and one question is for each. So if you have two, we can come back when we have time. 
Mr. Lirichatla. So uh, I'm going to ask my question in Tibetan so that I'm going to request Astrologer Londila to translate my question so that it could be more clear that I want to ask. Sure. Any Tanda Kelatanda or Richard Lagi Tananzo Kawashishto? Take Nalolia Tananzo or Media do Nalolia self compassion seizure. Take Kawan Alotsu to raise it. So the question was you talk about four pillars of well being. Four pillars of well being. So where does self compassion fit in? Self compassion is part of connection. It's really connecting to oneself. Um, so uh, uh, self compassion is very much a part of the connection pillar. Yeah. So thank you for that. I have a question about the cases in particular. You cited there were 38. Is there an electroencephalogram in the process of like these hours or I don't know if I'm explaining the properly. Yeah, during, during the Tukdom, mm. yes. Uh, we have a recorded uh, EEG or electroencephalography and we actually published an initial paper on EEG and um, basically the bad news is that we don't see anything in the EEG. Uh, however, it's very important to appreciate that um, as I mentioned, we were not able in any of the cases to look at EEG changes in the first 24 hours. I believe that we're more likely to see something if we are able to measure the EEG in the first 24 hours. But we can say now with a lot of authority that after 24 hours, the EEG is flat. Actually, Professor, I have a very broad question. Actually, has there been any study which, uh, you know, uh, uh, sees the similarities between deep trance uh, states across cultures like in the Balinese and uh, deep hypnosis and also uh, our Tibetan med meditation. Has there been anything which uh, finds the similarities? Yeah, uh, there have been a number of studies including work in our laboratory that have looked at um, different types of meditation and also the similarities and differences between meditation and other um, related states like hypnosis. And there are a few things to say. One is that there probably are some similarities in terms of attentional features, uh, but there are really important differences as well. Uh, they are definitely not all the same. I can assure you of that with a lot of authority. Um, uh, and so we know, for example, even strictly within the Tibetan tradition, that meditating on compassion is completely different in terms of its brain state than uh, analytic meditation that's focused on emptiness. Totally different. Thank you, sir, for the insightful uh, talk. I wanted to ask regarding uh, the, the first part of your talk, which was on the four pillars of well-being. So as per your findings, I've, I believe you have found uh, some uh, connection of our well-being with awareness, mindfulness, con uh, with four of those pillars, connection, insight, and purpose, which is very much mentioned in our medical system. And I, uh, I have a curiosity that this such kind of information, which is with uh, hardcore scientists like you and your team, will this be available to the common mainstream uh, health system? How uh, uh, do you find any possibility or likeliness of this ki kind of uh, very insightful information? getting up to the mainstream health system. Yes, thank you so much for that question. We would love for this information to filter into the mainstream health sector. Um, in the United States, we're doing a lot of work with uh, healthcare 
uh, and bringing these four pillars of well-being into healthcare, we have a very simple um, questionnaire that measures the four pillars of well-being and takes about two minutes to complete. Uh, and one thing that we would be very happy to do is to share it with you. Uh, you can translate it into Tibetan and use it in your ongoing medical work. And it may provide some interesting insights. Uh, you can give it to a person when they first see you, and you can see what are this person's areas of strength, that is, which pillars of well-being are high, and which are more, which are lower um, pillars that may need to be strengthened. Uh, and so uh, uh, that would be something that I think would be very, very interesting to explore. And we'd be very happy to send this measure and uh, have you translate it. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, I'm just curious to understand your understanding or uh, how you define mind as a neuroscientist. So how do you understand mind? Um, how do I define mind that as a neuroscientist? It, that's a very challenging question. Uh, I will tell you how most neuroscientists define it, and then I'll share how I would define it. Most neuroscientists would say that mind is an emergent property of the brain. So what do we mean by that? Well, mind arises from the brain, they would say. Um, and therefore, it is wholly dependent upon the brain. So um, mainstream neuroscience would strongly argue that there is really no such thing as mind without brain, that you need brain for mind to manifest. Um, my view is a little bit more nuanced. Uh, this view of mainstream neuroscience, I would argue, is more of a belief uh, than it is a fact. It's not a fact. Um, uh, it's really a, a conjecture, a belief. It's, it's a worldview. Uh, and uh, there, there is a problem in neuroscience that we often refer to as the hard problem. So what is the hard problem? The hard problem is how does experience arise from the material matter of the brain. And my strong belief is that we as scientists have not made any progress on that question in the last hundred years. We are no closer today to understanding that than we were a hundred years ago. And so uh, uh, my view is more agnostic. I don't know. Uh, this is an area where we're pushing up against the limits of our science. Uh, and I think it's healthy to suspend our beliefs and to not prematurely um, judge the nature of reality. Uh, uh, there are Many people I know who I believe, who I consider to be extremely thoughtful uh, and wise, uh, such as His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who have very different beliefs about the mind. Uh, and so uh, uh, I um, do everything I can to rest in this not knowing. And I try to train my students to do the same. <clears throat> Sorry, Richard. Uh, recently, in the case of uh, the Lama Prasan Shambhila uh, Geshe Tovgyala, so the team, the Tukdam team, they have found that uh, the Lama, his hair was grown a little longer. 
in the inv in, in investigation uh, investigation. So uh, can I can I have the scientifically reasons behind that happen? Yeah, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> I do not know. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, these phenomena are extremely interesting. Uh, I believe the first thing we need to do is to carefully document them using rigorous methods. And, um, uh, and then we need to start thinking about how that might occur. Uh, one, um, uh, one thing that we believe is likely is that there is a certain subtle kind of metabolic activity that can continue to occur after uh, the heart has stopped and the person has stopped breathing. We, we know, for example, that animals who are hibernating, uh, they can hibernate for the whole winter and they stop breathing during hibernation. Uh, uh, and uh, they're able to exist in this very subtle kind of state. Uh, uh, and so uh, I actually think that there are physiological mechanisms of hibernation that may be relevant to understanding some of the changes in Tukdam. Uh, so, uh, um, so there are some parallels in um, the biological world, uh, but we really do not understand this at this point in time. Um, so my question is more related with the Tibetan medicine kind of connection. Um, where or which of the um, dissolutions uh, of the body and the process of dying is the one that is getting longer? Are these bodies not getting into the process or what's like in there? I, I kind of don't have it clear. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for the question. I'm not sure I can shed much light on it, but uh, one of the things that seems clear is that there is the initial dissolution of the sense modality. So seeing, hearing, um, touching, taste, smell, all the senses um, shut down. Uh, and that may actually help to, um, uh, to uh, um, increase the, uh, um, the signal, if you will, uh, from the mind because there's less distraction from the senses. Uh, the preservation of the body uh, that I was referring to earlier, um, you know, we, we don't know what the mechanisms for that are at all. Um, uh, it, it does suggest that there are continued metabolic changes that uh, seem to be playing some role in this uh, that can extend over, in certain cases, quite a long period of time. Um, uh, but again, uh, we have not been able to take any tissue samples. So one, one thing that we've talked about for the future is the possibility of obtaining buccal swabs from the inside of the cheek. Uh, these cells can actually be <coughs> extracted and we can extract DNA from these cells and we can look at epigenetics and do all kinds of um, really uh, sophisticated analyses. So, um, you know, at some point in the future, we hope to be able to collect some of these um, biological samples, which would um, potentially provide us with a new window on what may be occurring. Good afternoon, and uh, My question is regarding uh, uh, the four pillars of well-being that you have given us talk, and uh, from your experience, in which uh, pillars of well-being do you think that our mentally challenged or ill or mentally unstable person should work more? Yeah, it's a great question, and um, uh, in our understanding, and there's a lot of evidence for this, uh, no single pillar 
is associated with mental disturbance. All four of the pillars could be. And it really depends on the more precise aspect of the mental disturbance. Uh, and it suggests that strengthening uh, all four pillars can be helpful in decreasing mental disturbance. But we know, for example, that anxiety and depression can be associated with increased distractibility, which would be part of the awareness pillar. It can be associated with extreme loneliness. That would be part of the connection pillar. It could be associated with a reified sense of self that would be associated with the insight pillar. And it could be associated with a lack of purpose in life that would be associated with the purpose pillar. So all four of these pillars contribute to mental um, challenges, uh, just as all four contribute to our well-being. So it's no, not, not any single pillar. Um, similarly, uh, the quality of resilience, which is so important, we have evidence to suggest that every one of these pillars contributes to resilience. Resilience does not belong, if you will, to any one pillar. It belongs to all four. So we'll have the last question. Professor, I have a very difficult question to ask you. The point is, uh, the point is that about 20 years back when we were studying, uh, prior to neuroplasticity, it was a given that once you are mentally sick, you are sick, you got a label that you are depressive or you are psychotic, something like that. Even after so much research, practice in biomedical uh, parameters, no, they still continue with the old uh, antidepressants, which have so many side effects, antipsychotics and everything, while uh, the core of your research shows something very uh, positive, you know, something which we can look forward with hope. How can we change this system? That is my question. Yeah, I share your your view completely. Uh, uh, the system needs to change and it's slowly changing. Uh, as the scientific evidence becomes more and more compelling, um, you know, uh, as you say very correctly, there are serious side effects of the kind of medications like antidepressants and antipsychotic medication. And there are other strategies to train the mind. Uh, and this is where the dialogue between science and Buddhism is so important. Uh, and so we have demonstrated, along with other scientists, that when we train the mind, our brains change. And in fact, uh, I'll put it a little bit more specifically we can see more specific changes in the brain through training the mind than through any drug that you can take. More specific changes. Uh, when you take a medication like an, an SSRI, an antidepressant, or an antipsychotic, it's like blasting the brain uh, in, in its entirety. Uh, and so it's a very general effect we can see a much more specific effect with mind training. Uh, and so uh, it's our aspiration that as the scientific research gets more and more compelling, uh, we will see a shift. And we are seeing a shift. Um, we're seeing a shift, I know, in the United States and in other parts of the, of the world as well uh, as the scientific evidence becomes more compelling. So thank you all so much, and I really appreciate this opportunity and the great questions. Thank you.